Hello everybody, I hope you had a great Easter weekend, everything went well, everyone's doing okay. We are looking for Mr. Grant Waite. Let's see if we can find Grant pretty quickly. There he is. Quick. He's fast. Now he's... Where was he? Where'd he go? I saw him there somewhere. Where is he? Where is he? There he is. He's on his way. Grant, how's it, mate? Good, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for coming on, brother. I appreciate it, man. I know, uh, I know we've all got quite a bit of time. You said you've been playing some golf. Yeah, well, Florida, we're one of the lucky states where the, um, the governor, Ron DeSantis, decided that golf's essential service. So he kept the, the, most of the golf courses open. I think the, the city courses are closed, but the okay. clubs are. They're open now. The, the, the clubhouses are closed. So you, you can't go inside and get some food or interact with the um, staff or anything. You can order food. They'll bring it out. But we, we get to go play. They sanitize all of the golf carts after every round. And so you could probably eat off of those things now. They're so clean. <laughs> <laughs> but they, it, it was, it, the idea was that you want to get still people, you want know, to get in the uh, locked in your house and for so long and so they decided that you know this open space and if you keep your distance yeah and play golf and, and and golf's a big industry here right so sure it is yeah um that as well so golf courses have been packed so we've been the weather's been good been able to play so making yeah, a lot the of weather has been great yeah. hasn't it <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people probably listen to this and locked in their house, can't play golf, the weather's bad, and like, man, we hate Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not liking you right now, Grant. They're not <laughs> liking you. Um, Grant, thanks so much for coming on. I wanted to talk just a little bit about, tell us, you know, you're from New Zealand. What part of New Zealand are you from? So I'm from Palmerston North. So New Zealand's two islands, the north yeah. and south, and we have a little Stewart Island down the very bottom, but two main islands. And I'm from the southern part of the North Island. Wellington's the capital, which is very on the southern tip of the North Island. I'm 90 miles north of there. So just okay. a little place. It's a, it's a college town. Massey University is there. Um, and so when I was growing up, there was around 50, 55,000, which in, in New Zealand terms is actually a reasonable sized city. Yeah. And, uh, we had a couple of golf courses and so I had access to go play and, and that's where I grew up and it was a, it was a very nice place to grow up. And how did you get to the PGA tour? How did you, how did that happen? <laughs> Obviously you became good. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, uh, how long do we have on this thing? <laughs> We've got 55 minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'll tell you how I got into golf originally. Um, so like any, any kid, I was um, 12, uh, almost 13, and I got in trouble for uh, not doing something else. So I'm doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. So my dad decided he's, I'm going to go caddy for him um, at a, just a little uh, place around the corner um, that a farmer basically put up on his property. And he had electric fences around the greens to keep the sheep off. And he used the sheep. Sheep was the way that they mowed the fairways. So we went out and I kid, he was a left-handed golfer. And when we got done, I said to him, and I was pretty good at every sport that I played. Yeah. And I said, you know, well, Dad, I tell you what, I've never played golf in my life, but I'm pretty sure I could do better than that because that was terrible. <laughs> And he's like, oh, it's a lot harder than you think. And I'm like, well, clearly you're making it look like that. So um, I, he goes, well, okay, we're going to play. Uh, we'll play again uh, another time. So we did. And I used his left-handed clubs. And, of course, he shot about 90 and I had about 115. And he goes, see, it's not as easy as you think. And I said, yeah, I tell you what, that's going to be the last time you ever beat me, though. So I went and practiced and came back. And then uh, I actually switched over to right-handed clubs because I couldn't find left-handed clubs. Yeah. And uh, just said, okay, I'm going to beat my dad and went and practiced and went back out and he never beat me again. And so uh, and once you start doing that with golf, you get hooked on it. So uh, that's how I got started. Yeah. Um, and then just a little bit, little background on me and I'll try and make this kind of short. I know I talk a lot, but uh, um, uh, in order to pay for my own golf clubs, I had to get up in the morning at 4.30 before school and deliver milk. We used to have a milk run. We used to deliver it in the, in the bottles in New Zealand at the time. Yeah. And I would make about $25 um, uh, a week. And I would take that, went over and paid the pro $20. And he gave me a set of clubs and let me pay him off. 
So I uh, got my right hand at clubs and just started practicing. And then uh, for whatever reason, um, I just had a, a feel for it, I guess. I got, I got better than all the other kids. And there was a few friends of mine that we all started at the same time. And when you get, start to get good at something, you know, you just want to keep doing it. And uh, so I started entering tournaments and then winning tournaments. And I'm like, wow, yeah. I'm like the, the second coming here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I got I got really uh, into playing, um, and then uh, I got to where started playing national events, and then things started going wrong. Right, I was like, oh, geez, I'm nowhere near as good as I think, and man, these, some of these guys are really good. How am I going to do that? And you got two ways two ways to do that. Really, was to just keep doing what you're doing and practice more, which was kind of the thought. I call that the romantic view of getting better, because you just assume you're going to get better, and you may or may not. Right, and yeah. then. Um, or you can take some instruction. And the, the, the um, golf pro at the golf course I was at started showing me some things that I, I hadn't really didn't know anything about. And, and I started to improve again. Then I went to the national level and uh, started winning some of the national events, junior events. And then I got on the New Zealand team, went over to Australia, won the Australian Junior Championship twice, two years in a row, and then got recruited to come over to the University of Oklahoma. Went over there, played four years, won some college tournaments, was three-time All-American, and then um, came out of there and decided I want to try and play this professionally, which I really want to do. Came back to Australia, went through the tour school, got through there, and then um, tried the U.S. tour, missed. Uh, tried a couple times and missed. That was 80, 87, 88. I was, and, I was in that same tour school. I think the, the year you made it, it was at the Lakes. Yeah, uh, the, right. the, yeah, you yep. shot 60, I shot 78 in the first round, you shot 65, I'll never forget, and I was like, what kind of golf course is this guy playing? Because it wasn't the same one I played. Yeah. <laughs> I lucky that day, I think. So. No, no, you don't get lucky and shoot 65 out there. Yeah, no, that's right. And um, that's, that's, you're right about that, that's a tough course. And then, um, and then I came over and eventually got my tour card and got on the US tour and just pursued that for, what, 13 years out there. So that's kind of my story. And you know, it's a it's an interesting story because when I told people in New Zealand when I um, started to get better and I started, especially when I started winning national events, I said, "Well, I'm going to go to the U.S. and get on the U.S. tour and I'm going to get on the PGA tour." People just thought I was insane. They just they couldn't comprehend yeah. that, that they knew could do that. And I kept looking at them, going, "Well, I'm, I watched the TV. That guy looks just like me. Why why can he do it and I cannot?" Yeah, it didn't make any sense to me. So I was naive enough to think I could do it, and I look well, back. What an idiot. You really had not much. No, time. you got to believe, baby. <laughs> that's awesome. So anyway, so that's my story to the PGA Tour. Cool. And, and Grog, what's your take? What's your take on instruction? Because obviously, there are successful players. And we checked out a little bit earlier. There are successful players. You've got Bubba and Sevi and Lee Trevino and that group of players. And then you've got players like Tiger Woods and even Jack Nicholas and Rory McIlroy who had great success with coaching. So what, what's your take? How do, how do we as coaches, how do we as golfers put this all together? Yeah, so what a great, great question. I think this is fundamentally on a philosophical nature, really important to understand, right? Because like you said, like Jack Nicholas is the greatest winner. He, he's won 18 majors and Tiger's won 15. Uh, and you can see Tiger's changed the swing maybe four times since he's been on the PGA Tour. The last one really forced by a back injury, but he's had to kind of adapt. Uh, he's had instruction pretty much all the way through uh, mm. early days. Um, Nick Faldo changed his game from being a non-championship winner to winning, what, I think he won five maybe. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side, you've got like a Sam Snead, a natural seven, and you have Seve won, I think, five, and Phil Mickelson's won five. And so there's players on both sides of, of the coin, right? So the answer is, well, well, so what do you do? I think some of it's personality driven. I do. I, I think that if you're a naturally inquisitive person or you're struggling with something um, and you want to get better, there are some people who are inclined, like I was, to say, okay, well, okay, then clearly I don't know enough about what I'm doing. I want to be better mm -hmm. at it. I need to go seek out people who are better at it and and improve so instruction really fulfills that for a lot of people who think that way so i think one it's personality driven right i think the yeah. other you have to... sorry about that um i think that the other the other part of it is there is a cost that you weigh up 
Now, even it costs for amateur players. So they can decide, okay, I've got a limited amount of time. I've got a limited amount of funds here. I just can't spend you know, all my money on golf instruction. But they want to get better. So that you, there's a cost to doing it, which is, okay, I've got to relearn a pattern. I'm going to have to uh, trust the person that I'm, I'm do, uh, with, uh, helping me. I may get a little bit worse in the short term because you have to now fight a pattern that you do versus a pattern that you're trying to do. Uh, so yeah. there's a cost to that, right? And you have to, and, you, you, and as a coach, you have to support that player. Now, as a, on a, when you're coaching players that are really good, there's a serious cost, especially a PGA Tour player, that you got their, their job is, is really in the balance. And the difficult part is, each Thursday, they got to tee off. So you, you, you cannot strip them the ability to play, but you're trying to move them in a direction so they can play better. So it's a real, it, it's a real dilemma. So the way that I look at it, I think that it's personality driven and it's up to the person to decide what the cost to them is. Is it, if I do nothing, I'm going to be, here's where I'm going to be. If I mm. do something, here's the potential risk. So I, I believe that, um, that there's talented coaches out here. There's people like yourself, Andrew, that spend a lot of time researching and, and trying to understand, become a better coach, realize that at times, which we all have, we, we thought something, now we think something different. And really, if, if you're coaching the same way uh, today as you did a year ago, then you're not, you haven't improved as a coach. You mm. should have, your information should be better. Your strategies should be better. And that's what you're trying to do. And because the goal is like you are, you're a, you're a person who wants to help people. You're never going to do anything to hurt them. You will do whatever you can and, and employ whatever strategy. So I think the people who are in instruction and coaches are there for a reason to help people and they'll do whatever they can to do it. So I think instruction is very, very important. And I think you can achieve it uh, uh, to be a better player going down the instructional way because it's, it's a guide. Now, again, the words coming out of your mouth or mine when I talk to a uh, player, no matter what the level, is not going to change them. It's not. The, the person mm. is going to change themselves, their golf swing, their chipping, their putting, whatever it is they're doing. Right? They have to do it. What you're doing is providing them a guide or information to do it. And so it's no matter what, the, the golfer, and I always explain this to my students when they come, when they show up, is that, okay, I'm going to help you, but you're going to do it. It's not, I, I, I cannot do it for you. I cannot hit your shots. I can't spend the time on the driving range for you. I, I can't structure out your practice and make sure you're doing it precisely or the way that you, you need to do it. You're going to do it. But we, what we're trying to do is provide the right information or strategies in order to change. I like that. And, you know, I spoke to Chris Como Grant a couple of, well, it seems like months ago, but it was probably about a week ago. Yeah. And what I loved what he said. He said that, coaches are ultimately problem solvers yes and i could hear that thread running through what you were saying there yeah so so here's the thing right there's you, you, if someone has an issue and you're trying to solve that issue right there's lots of strategies to do it and there, there really are and you've got to find what resonates with that player what resonates with one player may not resonate with the other so you're constantly trying to solve their problem you're not trying to make them look like something so if we go over the course of time and i just we named all those players earlier from from jack nicholas to sam sneed to sevi to lee trevino and we can take lee trevino mm. and sam Snead. i mean um, lee trevino and jack nicholas because they played against each other they both hit the same kind of ball fly a little left to right one was lower one was higher they they don't look anything alike but they're having to apply uh, certain principles to make the ball curve the same direction, but they don't look anything alike. So if you, Jack Nicholas comes up with it and takes a lesson, for example, or a player like that, swings like that, the way that you may solve that is going to be completely different than how you would solve Lee Trevino. So a good coach should have in his toolbox lots and lots of ways to solve whatever the problem that that player has, but mm. you're trying to make them look a certain way. You're solving their problem, which is where is where I've you know recently... Uh, gotten so involved in understanding forces and talks because uh, uh, that's really what's going on here, how they're utilizing force and the result of talks that come from that in their golf swing to produce whatever they're producing. So problem solving really is, is the way, is what a golf coach is. You know, that's, that I think that's probably the best way to think about it. Mm. And I like to think about it as I'm going to do my best to have a massive toolbox as your coach. Yes. I'm working, and if I'm any good as a coach, I've got a massive toolbox, 
and I'm going to use my experience, use my knowledge to pull out the appropriate tool to fix this problem. There's yeah. no guarantee that it'll be the right tool, but I'm going to use my experience and my knowledge base yeah. to select the right tool to help this player as best possible. There's no guarantee it's going to work, but I'm going to do the best I can as your problem solver. Yeah, and, and that's, what you just said, I think, is really important, right? So there's experience here that's important. Mm. Now, you've, you know, I've gone down the road where I've tried to help a player. It hasn't worked. You're like, okay, what did I miss there? And then I'll you know, try and help talk to that player. Okay, so what's, what's going on? What are you having difficulty with? I mean, let's try this strategy. The conceptual framework doesn't change. Just like you said, you yeah. just use your toolbox and bring another, another tool back out and let's try this. Now, you know, that can, a lot of people maybe confuse that with say, oh, he's just trying all kinds of things. No, I'm staying within the conceptual framework of what I think mm. you should do. I'm just trying to get, have you think of it in, in a certain way using this strategy that may resonate more than the others. And that experience of when to stay on something, when to move in a different direction, how hard to push the player, how many things that they can do, the order that you're going to do it is really important. And as a, as a coach, that's, that comes from experience. Now, we can all learn information. That's not the hard part here. Yeah. And how to use that information and apply it. And, and really, that's really important for that person standing in front of you. They've paid a certain amount of money to be there, and they've invested their time and trust in you. So your experience, and I think experience is underrated at times. I really do. I think that you, the, and the, all the levels of players, and the longer you spend on the range, the more important that, that, that you develop your skill and your craft. And that's why I, I'm a big fan of, of people like yourself that have been out on, in the trenches, coached a lot, also mm -hmm. have got a want to get better, know that they don't know everything, and constantly learning and trying to improve themselves as a coach and improve, and make that toolbox bigger. That's a that's a great thing. And I um, I really I, and I'm in the coaching industry, and I had the other side where I play, which I'm going to like to talk a little bit about um, on how uh, both sides of that. Um, but I, I, that I, I think that the people like yourself or all these coaches that are in it that are passionate about this, it's, it's never stop learning um, and seek out those who have the experience. And m I think almost every coach and person I've come across in this industry are willing to share and help. So much yeah. like, uh, I, I was talking with Martin Chuck the other day and uh, the one day we were driving down the road and we had a great discussion and Essentially, we both agreed it's been about two decades since, since we thought we knew everything. Right. <laughs> and right. the more you know and the more experience you get, the less you realize you do know. And right. you get further and further away from that point. So I think it's a good point to get to where you use the word naive. You're young. You're arrogant. You're naive. You're, yeah. I got this. This golf swing thing, I got it. And then you keep going down the road and you realize, no, 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 maybe I don't. Right. Maybe I don't have it. And that's evolution, right? And I think that I, I want to make sure that um, people understand when I say this, right, is that, you know, the, the coaches that came before us that were in a time when they didn't have access to some of the um, yeah. data and, and um, objective data that we can measure from, you know, from all the three-dimensional stuff and then track man's of, uh, uh, all the information we're learning about the in impact dynamics and all the stuff that we're learning, right? Force plates and GI. Oh, right. so they didn't have access to that stuff. So, but they did the best that they could. Now, so they got some of it right and they got some of it wrong. And that's, that's okay because the, as you evolve and evolution and instruction is evolving, um, that's important for people to know that it's a constant evolution. Now, I, I do hear, and this is why I sometimes, now, Brandel Chambly and I uh, are friends. I, I think he's an important player in the debate when it comes to instruction. I do. Yeah. I disagree with some of the things he says, and I agree with some of the things he says. But at times, he, he's a little critical on instruction when he's never really spent all of that amount of time on the driving range, what we talked about experience. And he wants to, he wants to think that the only way instruction is any good is if you get it right all the time. And it's just yeah. not going to happen, right? So mm -hmm. evolution says that we build on the shoulders of the people that came before us. So that the David Ledbetters, the Hank Haney's, the Butch Hardman's and all these people, whether you, you agree with kind of their philosophies or not, they helped build this industry. And especially David was really the forefather of that. So I have a lot of respect mm -hmm. for that. Um, and those guys, and then our job, now we have certain tools and things that are available to us that we can take what, what they did 
look at it, go, yeah, okay, this is good. We'll keep that. No, that's not so good. We'll get kind of rid of that. We'll form our conceptual framework and we're going to build on that. And as, as we get better, um, there are a few topics that we still really have no idea, like rate of closure and things like that that's going on with the club. That's a really important, that's a really important, um, uh, I think is really the future here. We, we have to understand that because there's this huge debate about this rate of closure, how fast the club base is, is closing and rotating. You know, guys like Phil Mickelson is a huge number and a guy like um, Zach Johnson is very small. Now, what, what are the factors that co control that? Which is better? I don't know. You can say Phil Mickelson, it looks like he's out of control, has won more tournaments than Zach Johnson, right? So things like that, we're, gonna, we're going to continue to, to evolve and get better and that's that's because of the efforts of the of the instructors before us, right? And but like yeah. you said, it came out, I'm like, oh, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Here's the answer. And then as you go along, you're like, yeah, okay, I really don't know what I'm have the answer either here, but I'm yeah. just the best you can, right? As, as they did. You know, talking about that rate of closure, you sparked a thought in my head. Wouldn't it be cool if, in the research side of things, as we try to understand that better, we could flush out the role of skill. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. So th th that'd be cool. Yeah, it would be very cool because the well, proprioceptive ability, right, is a huge, huge, huge factor here. Yeah. So let's, let's take Tiger Woods, like I said earlier, he, let's say he's changed his, um, let's say he changed his swing four times. He did something yeah. like, right on the PGA tour. Well, he won no matter what swing he used, right? So yeah. we, you could say, well, what was the point of it? Right. Well, some of it was because he was trying to evolve and in 2000, he won, you know, he had all four majors uh, from 2000, 2001. He, he won uh, the three majors in 2000. He didn't win the Masters. He won the Players' Championship and came around and won the Masters, right? So you go, okay, so he's got all four majors and the Players' Championship at one time. Now, if you won one of those in your career, that's a great career. He's got yeah. all five at one time. Okay, so why would you just keep doing that? Just keep doing that swing. Then no, yeah. why would you ever change that? And part of it is because as this, you know, as we're all driven, you know, to become better, you think, okay, I can improve in this area. And that's the cost thing that we was talking about earlier. Yeah. Now, um, he's a, he's a guy that not only wanted to win all majors, he wanted to win every single tournament he ever entered and went for a whole year. So, all right. So great. So he's gotten, he's gotten better. So he won every, no matter what he did. Now you take Phil Mickelson, who's got a, a maybe not quite as technically correct swing, managed to win what, 45 times. I, I think, on the tour yeah. like that a lot a lot right and five made and you, you would no one as i've ever heard have used him as a model for how yeah. to swing a golf club so his we would say his proprioceptive ability is really high so when it comes to the rate of closure i think there is there is there is the the certainly the technical side of it it would make more sense that if the club out club face is closing at like 2500 degrees per second you can say the downswing's 0.24 of a second. So you take the last foot is a very short interval. How much is face is rotating um, through that in impact interval coming into impact? And how much of effect does that have on the control of the ball? Because Phil Mickelson clearly was able to do it well enough. Yeah. To times. But I, I do think when we look at swings, I think there's a lot to be learned on what are the things that go into that? What are the kinetics to that, right? Not just what's happening, which is kinematics, but the kinetics of it, what's going into control of face, those things you can learn. And when someone really doesn't have control of face, you can start as a coach, there's more in your toolbox. Now you can reach out and say, okay, here's how we're going to get a little more control of face. So mm -hmm. I think that rate of closure, what's going on and knowing the, the, the kinetics behind it, I think that's a really, really important thing. And we, we, don't, we don't know the answers. People think they do, but they, we yeah. don't really don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I agree with you at the highest, highest level, there's a proprioceptiveness that goes on with these great players. And I've played with Phil and Jack Nicholas and Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods. And I played with all Tom Watsons and all of these guys, right? I've been fortunate enough in my career. I got some good pairings and was on at a time when there was really a change in, in generations. Uh, but I got to see, see them all, and I saw the attitudes change towards golf swings. You know, um, that generation was a little bit less concerned about it. This generation a little more concerned about it. Um, so I've kind of seen all of that. And I think no matter what, the guys that are at the top are certainly on the, the highest end of the food chain when it comes to appropriate ability. I agree. So, Grant, I've asked you this question before, but I'm going to ask it to you again just because I like your, 
your answer. I think everyone else would would appreciate it. I know that at one point you were paired with this guy in a red shirt right. on Sunday right. up in uh, the great country of Canada. Yeah. And uh, he was in a bunker on the 72nd hole and you're standing there. Can you take us through just the next minute of uh, emotion? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So that's right. So we, he, um, I drove it in the middle of the fairway. I had, I had say like 225 to the hole. I had like 205 to carry the water on the front left. So I'm like, okay, that's a five iron. I'll carry that up about 210 or so, 215, somewhere around there. I had a bit of adrenaline, it's a little downhill. Uh, and I'm going to try and hit straight up the center of the green and try to make it work, if anything, to the right. But yeah. so I got up and I really hit a great shot. And I was like, awesome. I'm sitting on the green. Stress levels kind of come down a little bit because there's a bit of stress on that. Feeling pretty good about myself. And Tiger's over in the bunker. And, and, I'm, like, and I, I, I'm about maybe 15 yards from him. And I, I'm like, okay, he's going to have to play left here and over the left side of the green and when he hit the shot it came out to the right and immediately i'm like oh, he's hit it in the water because it was about 20 yards to the right it was just like this incredible surge of adrenaline like oh he's hit it in the water right and the ball's in the air and i'm watching it and i'm like well, it's not coming down <laughs> and it just <laughs> managed to carry and then all of a sudden it was a, it was like all of this super high i had because i thought oh he's hit it in the water not that i was hoping he would but it was just a shock that i saw with the yeah. ball and then it carried on to the back of the green. And there was like this realization like, oh, okay, now I'm going to have to make my putt. So I went from a really high to, oh, no, that, that, that kind of took me out of my, my realm. So I went out onto the green, had my 25-footer, didn't make it. We ended up, he gets up and down and makes birdie. We, uh, we tied. Now, people have asked me a lot about that. And I've said over and over again, I'm like, you know, one grain of sand between the club face and the ball with a <laughs> pipe right there. Just one grain of sand just in between that club face and the ball. The ball would not have made it on that green. And uh, what are we talking about? Do you remember the, that, that guy, Grant Wade, beat Tiger Woods? That was, that was amazing. Can you tell me about that day? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, I had played with Tiger a couple times before, or a few times before, and I'd been around him because he was, uh, he joined the same golf course in Florida that I was uh, at Iowa. So I didn't get to play with him a lot at home, but I would see him and, you know, so I, I wasn't, when I was getting ready to play with him, because I'd played with him before, I knew what was coming. I already kind of knew it. So, um, you know, one of the things that I, I know what Tiger does is, and this is kind of funny, is that, he would let he would let the try to let the other player walk onto the tee first um, on the first tee. So then when he walked in, everyone's screaming, yelling "Tiger, Tiger!" to kind of help you know mm. as a strategy to kind of help realize where you are. Right? He's used to it. That maybe I'm not. So <laughs> I'll never forget this. We're on the putting green, and I'm like, kind of know he does this. So I'm I'm not going to go to the tee before him. It got to the point where <laughs> where the rules officials are like. Guys, you've got to, you, you're getting ready to tee off. You guys have got to get to the tee because we're both just still putting on the green. He kind of looking at me, and I'm looking at him, right? And I, yeah. so we walk on. We kind of walk on the tee together. So I'm as all he's screaming and yelling. I'm kind of waving to the, the crowd as well, like this is as if it was for me. This like, is for me, <laughs> <laughs> and no one really cared. But it's fine. <laughs> These are just the silly things that you do as a competitor to try and get yourself in the right frame of mind, right? Yeah. So um, we get we. On the first hole, we get up. I had a nice drive, and I'm telling you, T Tiger was airborne on that first tee shot. It, he swung so hard, and it was almost as if he was trying to show me how far he can hit it, and he's going to hit it past me. And he did. He hit it probably 25 yards past me on that hole, and I, I'm not sure. Yeah. So I was like, wow, that was impressive. <laughs> so I, got, I hit a seven iron up on the green about 12 feet. He had a wedge outside of me, and then um, we both two putted. And at that point, I kind of, everything, all of the nerves, which are always nervous on the first tee and the stress of what's going on kind of left. It was like, okay, what, do I, what am I doing here? Uh, I got up on the next hole, I was first to play. And I, I, just like a calmness was, was there. I was like, okay, I, mm. I'm playing really well. I know what I'm doing here. Just play my game and let's see what I can do here. And fortunately, I played very well. I birdied number two and three. Um, I birdied two, so I had a one-shot lead. Then we both birdied number three. He made a putt after I made mine. No, he made his putt, then I made mine. And then he birdied four. So we were both a couple under through four holes and, and tied. And then the game was really on. It was yeah. a, 
it was a it was a good feeling because I felt good about it. And then um, as the more we went along, the more comfortable I was continued to get. I felt like I could I could win because I was playing so well and yeah. um, and I was putting well, which for me is the most important thing. If I usually hit the ball okay, and then um, I was putting well, so I was on the green, and there was just a calmness, which is unusual for whatever reason. It was yeah, yeah. expectation that. You know, I'm not supposed to win, so it doesn't mm. matter. And uh, but it, it was a it was a really it was a it was a day that um, I continue to get asked about, which is a great thing. You know, very rarely do you finish second, and people even ask you about it. But just the way it happened and who it was, and at that time, that was in 2000 when Tiger literally fall out of bed and he everything just went his way, right? Yeah, and it yeah. Did, you know? yeah. So, um, but as a as a competitor, you know, I played with Jack Nicklaus. Um, uh, which is kind of a funny, a little bit of a funny story there. And then I um, played with Tiger Woods, which were the two of the greatest golfers that ever played the game, uh, which is kind of, it's a fun. And two, two that's neat, yeah. yeah. Not yeah. many people can say that. No, no, that's right. And both in a competitive environment, you know, I played yeah. in 1988 um, at the Australian Masters and um, the final round. Yeah, the day before I played with Greg Norman, who at the time was number one in the world and like the guy, yeah. Uh, played nicely with Greg, and then the next day I got paired with Jack, and I'm like, "Wow, I, I played with Jesus Christ on Saturday and God on Sunday." It seemed. Like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got to play, and, and that was and that was kind of a a funny story because I played with with um, uh, uh, Greg on the Saturday, and Greg didn't start out that well, and I was playing pretty good. So, but on the back nine, he turned around, he made an eagle, a couple of birdies in a row, and then a couple of birdies to finish, and. Uh, it was a very windy day uh, around Huntingdale, which is a very tight, very difficult golf course, past 73. And I shot 72, and Greg ended up shooting 70 or 71. He had a great back nine. So the next day I go out, I play with Jack. And, um, you know, uh, this is kind of a funny story, right? But it's a um, – at the time, it wasn't funny. So – I, Jack walks on the tee, introduces himself, and of course, and this is 1988, I've been a pro for literally four months. I went through all five months, went through all the qualifying schools and did all this stuff, and here I am up on the tee, and I'm, I'm like, wow, this is really Jack Dickless. This is kind of a surreal thing. Yeah. And like, this is the guy that won all these tournaments. You know, you've, I've watched him on TV, but he's like, here he is real, and I'm on the tee with him. He introduces himself like he had to, like, you know, nice to meet you, I'm Jack. And I'm like, yep. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> and he so he goes then the starter comes up and he goes okay um and when i walked on the tee he asked me about what i'd won and where i was from and uh you know i've been a pro for four months i said well i haven't won anything you know uh and, I'm, and i said and he goes well where do, where do you play where do you live and i said well as a joke i said well I, i'm originally i'm from new zealand but you know i, I play out of desperation really and he, he's kind of laughed and i laughed and i so we get up on the tee and he goes, and, and okay, here's the, the 12-24 pairing first to play from the United States, the winner of <laughs> four-time U.S. Open champion, six-time U.S. Masters champion, three-time <laughs> British Open champion, five-time U.S. PGA champion, seven-time Australian Open champion, two-time Australian Masters. And, and he just kept going. He just kept listing all these tournaments. And I'm, my heart rate at that point was probably about 100. Now it's gone to about 150. I'm like, holy crap, this is really <laughs> Jack Nicholas, right? And Jack's looking at me kind of going like, what is this guy doing? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, right? Like everybody knows. And then, you know, in those Westerns, when people would come into the saloon and they push open the, the, the door, yeah. everyone, the music stops and everybody kind of looks and there's just this dramatic pause, right, in the movie. Yeah. Like the bad guy walked in there and everyone's just looking around, don't know what to do. This guy announces all these tournaments, which I swear he even got to like the Ohio Junior Championship. It seemed like to me. <laughs> every tournament he ever won. And he, he gets up there and he goes, and not only that, ladies and gentlemen, but the greatest golfer that's ever lived. Jack oh. Dillard, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh. And he gets up there, the crowd's going crazy. And Jack, you're the man. You're the greatest, Jack, Jack. And now I'm literally, my heart rate's at 200. Uh, he gets up and he just does his thing, drive it right in the middle of the fairway. Nice little fade out there, 300 yards. I'm like, oh, my God. 
And then he goes, and his playing partner today, winner of absolutely nothing. <laughs> he said that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> playing out of desperation from New Zealand, Grant Way. I'm, I'm, Andrew, can you imagine? <laughs> people were kind of doing it. You were kind of a little bit laughing and clapping. And I'm, I'm like, I've been a pro for four months. I've won college tournaments. This is only my third event, right? I <laughs> two weeks ago. All this is going in my head, right? I'm like, oh, my gosh, that sounded sad. And then this thought in my head popped in my head. It was, what's a, I, I can't get the ball on the tee because I'm so nervous now. I'm like, what's I can't balance the ball on the tee? And I'm like, oh, don't be silly. You can do that. So I go over there. And, and I put the ball on the tee, and I got it on the tee the first time, and I'm like, oh, okay, great. I honestly thought about hitting three wood because I could just put it, throw it on the ground and just hit three wood off the tee, just get <laughs> off the tee, right, because I'm the, everything's just out of control. So as that's all happening, the, the, um, the, the crowd kind of clapped, and they were polite. They weren't really laughing, but they were all kind of polite, yeah. polite all this kind of stuff. And um, it gets kind of quiet. As, as I'm trying to get my stuff together and I stand back behind the board, just as it quietened down. And you know, Australia and New Zealand, we've got a, kind of a, a back and forth that goes. And a guy yells out, uh, come on, you sheep shagger. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then people Put some salt in the wounds. Oh, I'm like, oh man, could this be any worse? This is Jack Nicholas standing over there. This is not going how I wanted it to go. <laughs> but anyway, I got up and, Hit a beautiful shot. Ended up, I, I don't really even remember swinging, and I had so much adrenaline going on. But yeah, I, I'm sure. I hit Twenty yards past Jack, right dead center of the fairway. And now to this day, what Jack did, he came over and put his arm around me as we walked off the tee. And he goes, "Oh, I, I hear you. You went to the University of Oklahoma. What a great school! I went to Ohio State. A lot of good football played at those schools." And he was doing everything he could to talk to me, to try That's and get cool. my head straight. Yeah, right? which was very nice of him because I was really out in la-la land at this point. Yeah. I, and so in the, um, that day, Jack uh, didn't play his best golf. He shot 77 and I shot 73 and I finished third in the tournament. Now, it was a very windy day again. The next week, uh, Greg Norman had asked me to play a practice round. I said, great, I'll do that. And um, so I, and on the Tuesday, so on the Tuesday, I'm in the locker room getting changed and here comes Greg who won the tournament. And I hadn't seen him. And I'm like, hey, congratulations, Greg. It's, you know, it was good. you played really well because he shot 67 the last day. He won by like eight or some seven or eight. Yeah. And uh, he goes, yeah, he goes, I, I guess I was a, a little intimidated on Saturday playing with you. And I went, I intimidated you. Look, look what I did to Nicholas. He shot 77. <laughs> <laughs> You're the slayer. <laughs> anyway, there's funny stories that happens when you play on the turf. You, you, you play long enough, some weird stuff happens, but. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, okay. it sure does. Eh? Those are great stories, Grant. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to get into a little bit of swing stuff, Grant, because you certainly are uh, far down the road when it comes to swing knowledge, uh -huh. and you help a lot of good players. Give us your insights as to, let's talk about what's important to you in the golf swing, what matters, how you piece it together. If you could just give us your, your, your overview, your insights, as to the golf swing sure so okay so uh, um my evolution on that stuff is that i was much more anatomically um concerned initially which means certain alignments like you get you need to get your left arm here on the back swing and your shoulder plane needs to be like this and uh on the way down this is where things need to be positioned because really back then that's really what all we had we didn't understand that everything that we're doing in a golf swing so here's my philosophy everything that we're doing in a golf swing uh, produces a force that ends up at that handle, right? Because that's what we're hanging on to. That's what's moving that club. Mm. So that force has a magnitude and a direction and an amplitude, and you have an impulse. All of these things are going on at that handle. So what, when you look at great players over time, and I realize this, and a guy like Chris Como, um, and in fact it was Chris Como, had a huge influence on me when I, um, when I first met Chris, and we started talking, doing some things at the time he was, uh, finishing up his degree at Texas Women's University under Dr. Kwong. They were doing a study, and I volunteered to, to swing. Um, I remember and, seeing you in your underwear. I can't unsee right. that, actually. <laughs> no, <I don't>, you know, <laughs> sorry. Some people are still going through therapy with that. But anyway, the, um, 
So that's correct. So, I, and through that study, I, we learned a lot, or I learned a lot at the time. I was really interested in learning. So here was an opportunity to, for me, literally, not to be naked, but my swing to be naked out there and let's yeah. break this out, all right? And let's learn. And what am I doing well and what am I not doing well and, and so forth. So through that, I learned a lot. And one thing I learned, and, I, and it's, a, it's kind of driven me ever since, that Chris said, was that he goes, look, we're not trying to make everyone swing the same. We're trying to understand how great ball strikers who look very different are able to, to hit the ball so well. Yeah. So, again, a guy like Adam Scott is very easy to put up on a, on a um, video and say, okay, this is how you would swing, right? Because it's just, it's very beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. It, Middle it, matches, it matches the textbook. It, it does. It's, but I would say Lee Trevino hit the ball just as good, if not better, and so did Jim Furyk. And they don't look anything like that. So as, as researchers and as golf coaches, we have to explain that, right? Mm -hmm. So when I worked with Mac O'Grady, he had a set of preferences and he had three different models based on what you were doing. And he were these are the preferences for these models. So it was always about trying to get anatomically in line with that and then hoping then the club would then react to that. Now, that's a way to do it. The other way is saying, okay, let's understand what all these forces and the various talks that are going on in the, in the golf club and look at what are the best players in the world doing and realize anatomically they're all different, but they're able to produce certain relationships that go on in a, in, um, in a good golf swing or a good ball striker. So and a good golf swing is just someone who is able to, to be a good ball striker so such that the distribution pattern is good enough in order to play at the highest possible level, right? Yeah. We're, not, we're not looking for every shot to be great because it's impossible. We're just looking for some distribution pattern and the variability to be, to be small enough in order to play. So, you, so my philosophy on all of this and what I look at is just certain relationships, where that force is going, uh, the, um, the matchup based on that. For example, if a guy hand pass like a Jack Nicholas moves more out through transition and his left arms further out on the downswing, he's going to have a certain way to release the club, uh, um, re release his wrist angles into the ball to, to square the face versus Rory McIlroy, whose hand pass is really far to the end. Both great drivers of the ball. They don't look anything alike, but they're producing incredibly similar results with the driver. One draws it, one fades it, but they're, they're both very, very long, greatest drivers of their generation you know, yeah. you have to. So how do you explain that? Well, if you want to drive the ball well, you have to swing like Jack Nick. Well, no, you don't. You can swing like Rory McIlroy and drive the ball just as good. Yeah. So I, how I put a golf swing together is I'm like, okay, what are the matchups that go with that? And so if you we will just use those two for an example, just to use mm. an example, we'll take Rory McIlroy, who's a very, who from, from the top of his backswing to where his left arm's parallel to the ground on the way down. I call that Position four at the top, position five. This is all Mac from back in Mac days. Position five on the way down. Um, he's average in rotation. Average. He's not, not overly rotated. He's not under rotated. He's at average. But by the time he goes from left arm parallel to the ground to impact, he's the most rotated or one of the most rotated. So he's got an incredible acceleration, angular velocity of, of those segments uh, in order to rotate to get the club to come around properly. So that's the matchup that he had. So when I look at a player and his hand pass pretty far to the end, I got an option. Should I change that hand path? Right? Here's the cost. This goes back to the cost. Do I change mm -hmm. that hand path? Or do I, is he, does this person have the ability to learn to rotate better and then control through impact? The biggest force we got is centripetal force, which wants to throw the club out. You're pulling back to back to the center. Are they able to rotate and control that club th through impact? So I, I would look at that, right, and say, mm -hmm. well, based on the athletic ability of the person, what they're capable of doing. So, yeah, okay, we've got to get your hand pass out a little bit on the way down. Now, you take Jack Nicholas, the other side, he's much more out of his, um, with his hand pass. So if he continues to rotate, which he rotated about average, right, he's going to have his – it's easy for his hand pass to work a little bit around to the left here, and he's going to hit fades. But he had a beautiful release, so he had to stand up a little bit in order to get the club down – release his wrist angles down with ulnar deviation, various things he was doing with his wrist, and he could play and hit up with his driver as well because he hit the ball very high and very far. So he achieved his goal, but the matchups totally doesn't rotate as much. He's going to probably um, have, have to get the club laid down with more wrist angle action rather than rotation of his body. So those things, those things kind of guide me as to matchups, and that goes back to that experience that we were talking mm. about, is how much to do. So 
I look at the forces. I'm really interested in the forces, the talks, the matchups, the ability of the player, how much time, if it's an amateur, how much time they got to practice, what would be easier for them to do. All of those kind of things play into it. So that's, and like I said to you, my, the, the, you, you can't see forces in talks, right? But you can yeah. see the kind of, and you certainly, we don't, still don't truly understand, I don't think the kinetics of it, which is the things that go into it. Um, we can see the results of those kinetics, which is the, the, the kinematics of it, which is you are seeing what's happening, but it, we're going to keep delving into that so I could be a better instructor. And that's why I'm, I'm very much into uh, the PhDs who are measuring that, who are um, then giving us the information and we sort through what, how, how can we use this or is it important at all, right? So that, that's kind of an example of what I would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Grant, you mentioned earlier, you said something about you wanted to talk about how playing influenced yes. your coaching. Yes. You want to talk about that? Yes, for sure. So uh, it, it's an overriding part of what I said. So one, personality driven. So I went out and like any kid, have no idea what I'm doing, but I was able to put the club on the ball and just play. And I was better than most of the kids that I was around at the time. But then when I, as soon as I realized I went to play in different areas on a national level, I couldn't, just couldn't do it at that level. I'm like, wow, well, I have to learn. Now, my, my brain works such that I didn't think oh, I just need to practice more. I'm like, I, I need to know what to practice. How am I going to get better here? So I went and got some lessons. So I'm personality driven. I'm curious, right? Uh, but at the same time, I really wanted to play. And so you have to be able to take um, that curiosity, take the knowledge you've got, and then be able to go on the golf course and still apply it. So the application of this becomes really important because I cannot think the same way when I'm out playing golf as I am on the range. Because on the range, or when I'm taking a lesson, I'm really trying to change a neurological pattern. It's when I wake up in the morning, there's a pattern in my brain that says golf swing, okay? So when I go to the golf course, and it's a great thing about the human brain because that way you don't have to relearn everything every day. So the golf swing is in there. Great, but that's not the golf swing I want, right? So I have to change that pattern. So when I'm on the, on the range, I'm thinking very carefully, very precisely, making my movements exactly how I want them. Try, I try not to get frustrated with it because that blocks learning and just keep everything open to learning. If you can just be open to learning, what, how, why am I, like let's say I use a model of, we'll just say Adam Scott, and I'm like, okay, I like the way he does this. I'm going to look at, well, how much has he rotated here? Where is his left arm here? What's his right arm doing? Where's the club? Mm. And that's what I want to do. I'm not trying to be exactly like him, but that's my guide. So I'm very into it. I'm very mindful. I'm very careful. I do it at a speed that I can do it. And as soon as I understand it, then I go a little faster, wait till it breaks down, which it will, and then put it back together again and keep doing that. But then I've got to go to the first team and play. Now, I can't possibly think like that when I go play. Yeah. So you got to then turn that off, have an overall feel, do the best you can and go play, knowing that you're moving in a direction. So for me, I always had to tee off on a Thursday, right, with my career on the line, whether no matter what level I was at, a mini tour player or a PGA tour player, you got to, you got, this is how you make a living. This is how you put food on the table, right? Yeah. So you got to tee off and you got to play. So there's always that balance. And I was able to do that for the most part. Now, there were some times where for sure, instruction and trying to do some things uh, hurt me and there were some times i'm like oh, i'm not going to do any of that i'm just going to go play that hurt me as well right so that's that mm. factor so as a player um I, I understand the difficulty of it and i understand it certainly as a the, what the better players are going through with that because i had to do it so here's how i would do it i, I would always make sure i spent enough time that i would work on my mechanics or my whatever i was working on to to, to move my swing in some direction. But before I would leave the range, I would spend a certain amount of time incorporating that into some uh, the overall feel and then say, okay, now that feels comfortable. I can work with that and go play. It's not perfect. I don't expect it to be. And then now, now I would spend a little bit of time orientating that towards a target so that feel would relate a ball moving to that target. And so as a player, I think if you're, you know, even when you're, you're trying to improve, that's important right? It's learning or the change may be slower, but it's important to do that because you still, this is ultimately you're doing all this in order to play better golf. Yeah. It's a challenge, Andrew, and you know that, right? And the better yeah. player, the more they have at risk, the higher it is. And, the, and, the, and I want people to know the reason it's normal for it to fall apart. 
don't panic. You're just going to put it all back together and you go back to the rage and you're going to do it. And the more times you do that, the more comfortable you'll get. The amygdala is part of the brain. It's a fear-based part of your brain. And so when you go play, it doesn't know what this new motion is going to do. So it's afraid of it. So it'll default mm. back to what's comfortable rather than what's correct. And so yeah. the battle that's going on there, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 can, I can so relate to that, Grant. I, I like to communicate to my students. I say, look, what's our objective? Let's say they've come in, they're hitting the ball poorly. Our objective is improve mechanics at full or faster speed. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the, that's the objective. Yeah. How do we go about integrating the improved mechanics part? Because you've got full speed already. That, yeah. you, you came <laughs> in the door with that. So how do we integrate improved mechanics? And I like what you said. We've got to go slowly. You've got to be mindful. And I talk to my students about practicing at three different levels. Level one is stop and go slowly, tons of rehearsals, seven or an eight iron. You're just trying to hit the spots, yes. the changes. Yeah. Take ownership of the changes. Level two, we're now trying to integrate some flow, some rhythm to it. And there are no pauses. You can do all the rehearsals you want. But we're going to go slowly and it's going to be that one motion where we're trying to blend it all together. Yeah. Level three, now we go to kind of three-quarter speed and higher. Yeah. And I want each of my students, when they're practicing, technically, to work through level one, level two, level three each time. I don't want them to only do level ones. Yes. Because, because ultimately, just being able to do good level ones does nothing for us. Yes, correct. Uh, and so each time they've got to understand, let's go through level one, level two, level three. Let's get to the top floor each time we work on technique. Yeah. And that way you're going to be better prepared to be able to integrate performance, integrate scoring into that. Yeah. So let me ask you something here. Okay. So you do that. Now at level one, I do exa almost exactly what you do, right? Yeah. So that's good for me to know that you're out there doing that too. Okay. Yeah. That's confirmation. That's how I do it too. So, okay. So, but I, what I try to do is at level one, it's all about you've got to hit your spots and I want them mindful of the things that they're doing. So they kind of mapping it out. You're really just mapping, yes. out, laying down a track in your brain and that neural pathway that says golf swing. You're laying that out. You're doing it. When you do that, do you have them like hit their spots and then just come down and just tap the ball? Yes. I do too. The, I, yeah, I, the ball will go 50 yards. At, at most, right? I just yeah. tap the ball because I want your brain to now link up, I'm going to make this motion and I'm going to hit that ball. Because otherwise you get good at standing in front of a mirror and doing it. As soon as you go to hit a ball, you don't do it, right? So your brain has to link that up. So you do the same thing. That's what I do too. And that's basically what I do, same as you. And then level two is without any stopping, an overall motion. And I, um, and I always ex explain, I want people who are listening, other coaches or just golfers that are yeah. – yeah, to realize that it is going to fall apart as you go from one stage to the other, but yes. don't necessarily have to default all the way back to stage one unless you just lost completely your field. You slow back down and go to some speed that you can do it exactly the way you want and keep tapping the ball. Your brain will adapt. That's the great thing about human beings. We have an adaptation. Amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing thing, right? And you will adapt to it. And you just keep doing the process. You've got to trust that process and stay open to learning. It's not... It's not an easy thing, right? Because it's, you've got a neural pathway yeah. in there that your brain's trying to default to. This is, no, 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 no. This is how you swing a golf club. And you're like, no, it's not how I want to do it. I want to do it like this because I know in the long run this will be better. So it's a, it's a challenge. I like how you laid that out. And I'm glad that you have people just tap the ball as well. I, mm. I think mm. that's super important. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I really want people to grasp, listen, we need improved mechanics at full or faster speed. Yeah. Uh, and, and once people go, okay, that's my destination, that's yeah. where we've got to go to. It's not just getting this club in a better position. It's better mechanics at full speed. Yes. And, and once they get that, they go, okay, I've got to work from this bottom level all the way up to the top and see if they can integrate that. Yes. Yeah. And like you said, because at some point you're going to have to overlay speed. Now, when you do that, now we're talking about we've taken all the force out when you're yeah. doing early levels so there is yeah. no force but then when you start to add force to it there's an impulse there right so when you do that people are going to recruit speed or ultimately angular velocity which is club speed they're going to recruit whatever they can to do it and they'll want to default because 
they feel comfortable generating speed a certain way. When they're now doing yeah. a different way, it becomes it becomes strange to them. So they, that's mm. when things start to default back. That's why you try and take the speed out. So I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. When uh, I was working with Charles Howe regarding some of the things, couple of things he was doing, and, and it's slow. Yeah, he was able to do it. And then as soon as you add speed, he would recruit uh, a certain way and he would struggle with trying uh, with the changes. And eventually he got to the point where he was doing it uh, when and he felt like he was going slower. But because he was recruiting power in a different way, when we actually measured his speed, he was going the exact same speed. And he felt like he was going at about 70% speed. He was 118 miles an hour, both doing it both ways with his driver, which wow. is really fast, right? Really yeah. And in tournaments, he would get over 120 or 220. So it, 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 he was doing it. It just didn't. He just didn't feel like like he'd have a three wood or, or a long iron off the ground. And he's like, I, I don't know if I can get the ball in the air here. But he would hit it higher. But it just didn't feel like it. So that was that was the challenge uh, for him and for almost all players. When you recruit more impulse to hit this uh, or create more force. That's when things start going a little bit off because and yeah. that's why you take the speed out, which you do and I do, and then slowly add the speed back in and wait to see how it breaks down because it yeah. will break down initially. Yeah. It's, it's the analogy I try to use is like if I got into a NASCAR and I've never driven one in my life and these guys are going 250 miles an hour around the, the track, I'm not going to do my first lap at 250 miles an hour, no. right? I'll be in the wall so fast that would be the end of me. So, so what do you do? You go at some speed that you're comfortable to get around the track until so you kind of understand what the G-forces, how the car reacts, and then you go a little faster and a little faster and a little faster and before yeah. you're going as fast as you can, which not, maybe not mm. so can, but And that's kind of the way that you would do it. I, I don't... I, I, I like I, that analogy. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I, I do that's that. That's a good one. Yeah, because it, it, it hits home because, I mean, if you go into the wall, it could be the end of your life, so you're just not going to do it. Now, God, yeah. we continue to flail away, and I'm like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Just take yeah. the horse out here, get it the way we want, own that, and then just keep adding some amount of speed to it and then see how it breaks down, make corrections, and then there you are. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Grant, uh, I so appreciate your insights, mate. This has been great. I know we, we could kind of keep going all day. All day. Unfortunately, Instagram's going to shut us off in about two minutes. So I just wanted to kind of end things there. Thank you so much, mate. Of course, of course. Anytime, Andrew. I, I love. Please, you. please stay safe and and send love to your lovely wife Leah and uh, keep them safe. Yes, thank you, thank you, and you too, your family as well. Say hi to Terry for us. Thanks, my friend, and I really appreciate you coming on. Everybody, thank you so much for coming on. Stay You're tuned. Welcome. Anytime. Cheers, right. Grant. Thanks, eh?